This evening, we're delighted to have Lucasta Miller with us. Lucasta is a, a critic who has been published in all the main British newspapers and magazines, but she's also a biographer and has written several books, particularly on 19th century literary figures, the latest of which is this here. Keats, A Brief Life in Nine Poems, and one epitaph. And it's a book I highly recommend to anybody who wants to follow up after tonight's talk. It's an innovative biography. It, it, as well as being brief, it takes a different angle on biography and she anchors the book on nine of our most favorite poems and obviously nine of the finest poems ever written in the English language. So that's Lucasta's book. In fact, it's worth just noting that when Lucasta's book, which was published just two years ago, just now, was reviewed by the New York Times, the critic there referred to Keats in saying, and I quote here, for a certain quality of lyrical writing, Keats is unsurpassed since Shakespeare. So tonight, myself, and I'm sure all of you, Welcome to welcome Lucasta Miller to teach us a bit about how a tough little Cockney managed to achieve such wonderful outcomes. Lucasta. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Campbell, for that incredibly generous introduction and thank you very much for inviting me just before I start I, I just want to say if somebody can't hear me can you let me let me know as soon as possible and then we can try and do something to sort out the mic but but apparently I, I've got, I'm getting a thumbs up from the back so um, it seems it seems to be working yes um, you know it's such an honor to um, be invited to to speak to you today I mean I've, I've seen some of the incredibly distinguished um, speakers that, that that you've had before and it makes me feel incredibly privileged um, to be here and also it's a real pleasure for me um, to come to Glasgow uh, which I have to confess is is my first time to Glasgow not my first time to Scotland and as I was sort of setting off on my journey I was thinking about how in London I actually live very close to where Keats lived in Hampstead as in fact does Alistair Campbell who I understand was one of your um, speakers the other day and so I felt I was sort of almost following in his footsteps because he made a journey up to Scotland um, in the summer of 1818 um, when he was 22 on a walking tour with his friend Charles Brown. And they actually went on foot all the way um, up to the Highlands, practically from Liverpool. Um, so it was a, a it was a it really was a, a hiking holiday. Unlike me, I, I obviously flew in an hour and a half, which was you know, not, not quite as picturesque. And so, of course, as soon as I knew that I was coming here to Glasgow, I thought, gosh, well, I'm going to look up in Keats's letters and see, you know, did he go to Glasgow? What did he make of Glasgow? And he did briefly come to Glasgow. Um, and I found his account of coming into the city. I think it was on July the 13th, 1818. Um, but Unfortunately, it wasn't a completely sort of propitious uh, description. He describes how he 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 comes over the bridge, obviously with his friend Charles Brown, though he's not really mentioning Brown at the moment, and he thinks that people are staring at him. And you have to, I mean, he is this tough little cockney in some senses, but here he really is a bit of a nervous traveller out of his comfort zone, uh, because as soon as he arrives, a man comes up to him, and this man who, who Keats takes to be, he thinks this man must be drunk, and, um, and Keats immediately puts his arm up sort of in, in self-defense and the man just looks at him and says I've seen a lot of foreigners but I've never seen the likes of you at which point at which point Keats threatens to call the police now I as a biographer I think well what do I make of this little anecdote and I think one of the things it really tells us is you know how far Keats had traveled. He's not very well traveled. He's traveled a bit in the south of England. And he's really, you know, a lot of people don't quite realize what a, 
what a Londoner he is, that he spent his whole childhood absolutely in the centre of the city of London, born in Moorgate. It's this very sort of urban childhood. So although we think of him often as a nature poet, and of course he, he did write some absolutely, you know, amazing poems about nature. I mean, some of the best in the English language, like To Autumn. He's not really a child of nature in that sense. He is a child of the city. Um, so as Campbell said, I, the talk I'm giving today is going to be based on my book, um, Keats, A Brief Life in Nine Poems and One Epitaph. Um, Keats' life was brief, tragically brief. He was only 25 when he died of tuberculosis. Um, in Rome, where he'd gone um, in the vain hope of alleviating his symptoms. Um, and as Campbell's already pointed out, you'll be quite relieved to hear that my book too is, is, is quite short. Um, I set myself this challenge, really, of trying to get the sort of teeming complexity of both Keats the man and Keats the poet into quite a compact um, narrative Form. And I mean, that's something maybe, you know, if anyone has any questions afterwards, I'm fascinated by the form of biography and particularly the form of literary biography and all the decisions we have to make as biographers as to how we're going to tell this story. Um, and I also, um, of the, I think Campbell's probably explained a bit how the book works. I've chosen nine of, of Keats's greatest, most famous poems. And each one is printed at the beginning of the chapter so that I give the reader up close the experience of the poem first. But then what I do is to go sort of under the surface of that poem, to put it in its context, to put, um, to put it in the context of the flesh and blood, real complicated man who was John Keats. Because I'm very aware um, that most of us probably have first come across Keats's poetry in standard anthologies, where they are the poems are sort of taken out of their context and to that extent disembodied. And I wanted to write this book for somebody who perhaps had only come across Keats in that disembodied form to sort of re-embody him, or even perhaps for 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 someone who excuse me. Mm. who may even know, only know Keats from the couple of, of quotations from his works that have really sort of become totally deracinated from their context and become part of the language, like a thing of beauty is a joy forever, which I seem to remember is quoted even by Mary Poppins as she sort of takes a pot plant out of her capacious carpet bag. And I don't know about you, but I find it almost ironic that that's become Keats's most famous line, because to my mind, it's probably the least Keatsian line Keats ever wrote, because it is so abstract. The language is so abstract. A thing, it's very sort of indeterminate. Um, a thing, a thing is, is you know, it's, it's just there's no sort of concrete reality behind it. And I think much more typically Keatsian. Um, is something like, um, well, I will read you in a minute um, a stanza from Ode to a Nightingale, which really exemplifies um, what is, you know, I think the absolute sort of DNA of, of Keats's style, which is what his friend and uh, mentor Lee Hunt called his poetical concentrations, the way in which he takes these incredibly concrete, quite physical images, and he piles them one on the other, and each image retains its sort of um, independent existence, uh, concrete existence, and yet at the same time bleeds in this sort of metamorphic way into the next. So, I mean, this is a famous, famous bit from, from Ode to a Nightingale. Oh, for a draught of vintage, that have been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and Provencal song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrene, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth. Now, 
I mean, if you think about that, it starts, I mean, it's, it, it's about a glass of wine, isn't it? A draft of vintage. Okay. Um, and that's been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth. Yes, we're still sort of, that still sort of makes, as it were, logical sense. Tasting of flora. Now, yes, okay, you can imagine wine having a sort of, I mean, they talk about it having a sort of floral bouquet. But this is flora with a capital F. This is flora, um, a goddess. A woman. So this this is this is wine that tastes of a woman, and it tastes of the country green, and then it tastes of a dance. It tastes of a body in motion, and then it tastes of a sound. It tastes like Provencal song, and then we get this typical Keatsian sort of oxymoron, sunburnt mirth. You often get these these images where he sort of compacts together the negative with the positive, pleasure with pain. So you have mirth, you have happiness, and then you have sunburnt. This is about skin. This is about sort of scorching, painful skin. And I won't go on and on through the whole stanza, but just to point out how, you know, we are imagining this glass of wine. Well, I will go on because it is such a wonderful piece of writing full of the true the blushful hippocrene uh well the hippocrene was um in ancient mythology a fountain sacred to the muses so it's it's it, it's a fountain of water but this is blushful because of course it's it's red because this is red wine but of course blushful we blush it's it, it's human skin and then it's got these beaded bubbles winking at the brim so these bubbles they've become eyes and purple stained mouth. Now, is that because it's the mouth of the goblet or is it the mouth of the person who's drinking from the goblet? And then you get an even further layer of imagery and um, and sort of metaphorical sort of illusion in purple stained mouth, which is an allusion to the myth of Philomel, um, who was in ancient mythology uh, raped by Tereus. Um, and he ripped out her tongue so that she couldn't um, tell anyone about it. Is the microphone doing okay? Great. Um, um, and but uh, but um, the gods took pity on her and turned her into a nightingale. So of course this is the reference to um, the fact that this is from Ode to a Nightingale. But as you can see, that purple stained mouth, it's the exuberant pleasure of drinking red wine, but it's also got a much, much darker um, and, uh, and tragic element to it. Um, my title um, for today was body and soul, John Keats' body and soul. Um, and there's a lot of sort of, a lot of soul, a lot of soulfulness in the, in the sort of popular cliche of Keats. Um, but there isn't quite so much body, and I want to sort of put a bit of the emphasis on the body, because, you know, we tend to think of Keats as this rather ethereal creature, uh, rather sort of etiolated, rather languid. And of course, Keats, you know, he does try die tragically young, but we've got to think of the Keats before he gets terminally ill, who is, um, you know, a creature full of energy and drive. I mean, he's absolutely not the cliche of the sensitive poet, as you'd comically get, for example, in um, um, Ronald Searle's cliche of the schoolboy school poet, Fotherington Thomas, who skips around saying sort of, oh, the flowers are oh, the birds, um, and he's the school weed. Now, Keats was anything but the school weed. When he was at school, he was famous for fisticuffs. Um, and one of his classmates, um, you know, remembered him very well, said that boy Keats, I, he was an incredibly charismatic boy. I always knew he'd do something really special, but I thought it would be in the military, which is a really sort of different angle on, on this idea of the poetic Keats. Um, which is not to say that Keats isn't a sensitive person. He is. He was an incredibly sensitive person. But it's this sort of, there's this sort of febrile energy about him. This sort of, which can sort of sometimes shade into this hypersensitivity, which is, I think, what you get when he's feeling a bit nervous at entering a strange city, and a man comes up to him and he goes like this. Um, 
in fact, only a couple of weeks before he um, describes that scene, he's talking to a friend about how sometimes he he goes he, he experiences these these periods of sort of paranoia where he feels that you know he's suspicious of everyone. And Keats did actually have quite a, a, a traumatic childhood. His father died in an accident when Keats was eight. His mother then runs off. She then comes back into his life when he's only 14, and then she dies. Um, and he himself um, attributes this sort of nervous temperament to the early traumas that he suffered in childhood. If we're going to think about where this ethereal, etiolated figure of Keats came from, I think the one person we've got to blame is Shelley, um, who... Mm, um, who wrote a very famous elegy for Keats shortly after Keats died, called Adonais. Um, and in this poem, he presents Keats as a, as, a, as a broken lily, a pale flower, a gentle child, um, and almost as a sort of spiritualized essence. At the end, Keats is sort of transubstantiated into almost a sort of neoplatonic essence. Um, and he talks about how Keats is going to sort of join um, this band of, um, uh, of, of great dead poets um, um, robed in dazzling, what does he call it? Um, robed in dazzling immortality. Again, it's this very, very abstracted, um, spiritualized view of Keats. Now, Keats himself would have loved the idea of joining a band of great poets. He really, really identified with the poets that he admired. But he was always aware that their immortal works came out of minds that were housed in mortal bodies. He's always aware of their sort of physicality. When he, he sees um, a lock of Milton's hair, Keats himself has a physical reaction. He says, I feel my forehead hot and flushed. The emotional response he has to this sense of intimacy with something cut off from the body of Milton. And also when he, when he visited Burns's cottage, and I know you had a lecture on Burns, I think it was only last week. Um, and Keats writes a, a sonnet while he's in the cottage. Um, and he's really sort of aware of the fact that, that his own body is now filling the space, the physical space that Burns's body had once filled. Um, he says, this mortal body of a thousand days now fills, O oh Burns, a space in thine own room. Um, and he's also, and by this stage, um, um, Burns's cottage is doubling up as a sort of whiskey shop. And so Keats is also drinking some of the whiskey. And he goes on to say, again, it's very physical what he's describing. My pulse is warm with thine own barley brie. My head is light with pledging a great soul. But it's almost as if he feels he's, while he's physically drinking in the whiskey, he's sort of at the same time drinking in Burns's genius. Um, and it's almost like there's no distinction between the physical and the spiritual there. There's certainly nothing in Shelley's um, portrayal of this spiritualized Keats um, that, that gives you any idea of the way in which Keats writes about physical experience. This is a man who once said, oh, for a life of sensations rather than thoughts. Um, I mean, this is the way he writes about eating a nectarine, for example. Good God, how fine. It went down soft, pulpy, slushy, oozy. All its delicious en bon coin melted down my throat like a large beatified strawberry. So if that side of Keats doesn't get into, into, into Shelley's um, portrayal of him, you know, neither does the Keats, who is quite capable of, in a letter to, another letter to a friend, writing a really bawdy verse about having sex in a field with a girl called Rantipole Betty. Now, I didn't really, I mean, this word Rantipole rather sort of confused me. Um, so I looked it up in it, um, in a, um, a dictionary of the vulgar tongue from Keats's era. And a rantipole was a rather sort of delinquent good time girl. 
but to ride round a pole had a you know a much ruder meaning um it meant with a woman on top so in fact this these verses actually have a sort of comic point to them um because the whole point is that she's lying flat on her back dead like a venus tipsy so um this bawdy side of keats is something that i think um I've certainly find, found that there are some people who find it really sort of difficult to swallow. Um, but I think that, you know, there's a great exuberance about it at the same time. I've talked about how much he appreciated um, the whiskey in Scotland and the whiskey that he had in Burns's cottage. But the drink that he really liked was claret. And I, it's, a, it's a very famous passage um, and you may know it already, but I'm gonna read you Keats. Keats is peeing to claret that comes in, in one of his letters because it is such a wonderful piece of writing. What it reminds me of is the, uh, is the sort of the comic prose low life scenes in, in a Shakespeare comedy. Now, I like claret. Whenever I, whenever I can have claret, I must drink it. It's the only palate affair that I'm at all sensual in. It fills the mouth, one's mouth with a gushing freshness, then it goes down cool and feebleless. And then you do not feel it quarreling with your liver. No, it's rather a peacemaker and lies as quiet as it did in the grape. And then it is as fragrant as the queen bee and the more ethereal part of it mounts into the brain, not assaulting the cerebral apartments like a bully in a bad house looking for his troll and hurrying from door to door, bouncing against his waistcoat, but rather walks like Aladdin about his own enchanted palace so gently that you do not feel his step. Other wines of a heavy and spiritous nature transform a man into a Silenus. This makes him a Hermes. Now that um, account of, of, of drinking claret, um, just written in a letter for a friend, and I have to encourage you all, I mean, I'm sure some of you have read Keats's letters or extracts from Keats's letters, but please, please go and read as many of them as you can because I mean, I do not know of any letters in which a dead poet is so alive as in Keats's letters. I mean, Byron's letters are magnificent, but one always thinks that Byron had, you know, a little bit of an eye on, on posterity when he wrote them. Whereas Keats, it really is just pouring out of him, stream of consciousness, like communicating um, with his friends. Um, and yes, as I said, that's that description of claret. He writes it not that long before he writes um, O to a Nightingale with that section about O for a draft of vintage that I, I read at the beginning of the talk. Um, and almost you can see him sort of rehearsing the poem in the letter. Now, when I read that to you and went through the way in which he mixes all these images together, Part of what I sort of wanted to do is in a sense to try and make Keats strange again, because he's so famous that we sort of always think we know what his poetry's like. Um, and it's sort of almost become normalized to us. But at the time he published, writing like that was utterly experimental and original. I mean, you know, and, and, and many, even, you know, many of his readers, I mean, even sympathetic critics would say things like, we just can't sort of understand what he's, what he's talking about. I mean, you know, why does he have to be so original? And Byron was particularly sniffy about that, but that passage from Ode to a Nightingale. He said, um, oh, I can't imagine. I mean, what could he possibly mean? A beacon full of the warm south. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and I'm going to be talking a, a, a little bit in a minute about Keats's reputation in his lifetime, because although, of course, he's now recognised as one of the greatest poets ever to work in the English language, that was not the case um, in his lifetime. And of course, um, the epitaph that he very poignantly wrote for his own gravestone was Here Lies One Whose Name Was Written in Water, as if he thought he was going to disappear. I don't think it always felt like that because at a slightly earlier stage, in fact, when he'd just been on the receiving end from some pretty negative criticism. I mean, his poetry was called things like driveling idiocy. I mean, these critics in those days, they really didn't pull their punches. Um, 
um, you know, he, he just quietly says in a letter to his brother, I think I shall be among the English poets after my death. And this, you know, he's not being particularly boastful. It doesn't feel like a boast. And, you know, he was right. I think he sort of knew that he was doing something really quite new and strange with, with English poetic language. I was asked to do something quite um, interesting the other day. I was asked to take part in a debate between the three great second generation romantics, Byron, Keats and Shelley. Um, and of course, it was a bit of an artificial thing, but it was quite fun. And I, of course, was representing Keats. And there were, um, you know, two other writers being Shelley and Byron. And so, of course, you know, Shelley's this great intellectual. He's probably the cleverest. He's this great political radical. He's definitely the most radical of them. Byron is the wittiest. And he, you know, he, you know, he, he creates practically single handed the whole sort of idea of the celebrity culture. And Keats, and Keats is the one I was rooting for. I mean, at the time, he is very much the underdog, very much the outsider, very much the outlier. Um, I mean, for a start, he doesn't have a conventional classical education. I mean, unlike, you know, Shelley, who goes to Eton and Oxford, um, although he gets expelled from the latter, and, um, and Byron, who, who, who goes to Harrow and Cambridge, they have these very sort of standard elite classical educations. And of course, um, they come from an elite section of society. I mean, obviously, Lord Byron is an aristocrat and, and Shelley was the son of a baronet. Now, Keats didn't go to a posh public school and he didn't go to university. He left school when he was only 14. But it's a little bit more complicated than that, because in fact, part of the problem that some of Keats's contemporaries had with him and his his hostile critics would, you know, w w would call him sort of vulgar, undereducated. Um, you know, they they you know they thought he you know that he was sort of lower class, but but you know he wasn't sort of he actually came from a rather sort of ambiguous up and coming sort of I suppose lower middle class very metropolitan um, society um, you know in those days the cultural sort of the cultural cliches the cultural prejudices were that you could be slotted into being an aristocratic poet like Byron or you could have the label of a so-called peasant poet like Burns or, or John Clare but Keyes didn't fit any of these things I mean his father does in fact come from quite a, um, um, a humble background. He works as an ostler or stable hand in a very prosperous livery stable in London, uh, which, um, which was um, run by, in fact, the man who, who, whose daughter, this humble ostler, marries. So he marries the boss's daughter and eventually um, takes over the business when his, his um, father-in-law retires. And as I said, it's a very prosperous business, a livery stable, hiring out horses, stabling horses. I mean, you know, horses are basically the only form of transport. So, you know, it's in big demand. So Keats wasn't exactly poor, um, although he, um, you know, both his parents are dead by the time he's 14. But, you know, he has enough of an inheritance um, that during the period where he's writing poetry, um, you know, he's able to not to have to earn his living. He's got a trust fund. Um, and as Campbell mentioned in his introduction, one of the really crucial things about Keats's education is that at the age of 14, he goes off to be apprenticed to an apothecary, um, which is the first step in training to be a doctor. Now, in those days, everybody who trained to be a doctor did it that way. It's like if you wanted to go into the Navy, you had to go in as a midshipman at, at 12. You learned on the job. Um, it used to be thought that Keats was this sort of 
poetic dreamer who didn't really attend to his medical studies. Um, he was just thinking about poetry. But more recent scholarly research has shown um, that he was actually a really very committed and um, really very successful medical student. Um, he went on to Guy's Hospital, where he was promoted to the role of, of dresser, which basically meant an assistant surgeon. And indeed, he would be, um, you know, he'd be assisting at operations, he, I mean, which were really, really grisly in the days, particularly before anaesthesia. Um, and um, uh, and he, he'd even been banning the equivalent of A&E one week in four um, at the hospital. And on one occasion, he saved the life of a woman who'd been shot in the neck by her jealous husband in the Prince Regent pub. He successfully removed the pistol ball and, and, and saved um, this lady's life. Um, for me, um, I, as you can tell, I've been, well, you've, yes, you've probably spotted that I'm talking to you tonight in quite a sort of discursive way rather than set, laying out a, a, a thesis um, in a very formal way. But if you put me on the spot and said that I had to come up with a thesis as to why John Keats was able to create this extremely unique and original voice at the time he did. I think I'd, I'd point to three things. One, I'd point to his rather sort of outsider marginal position in society where is, he doesn't quite belong within the class structures. He's, 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 it's rather amorphous. Um, so I think that sort of gives him, uh, it, it makes it likely this is going to be less conventional. Secondly, and this is really important, the medical training. This gives him this very sort of intimate sense of physicality that you get in his poetry. Um, I feel that, um, you know, when Keats uses a metaphor like a naked brain, which he does in his poem Endymion, we know, we can know for sure that he has actually seen a naked brain in the anatomy room. And the physicality of his poetry was something that really discombobulated his contemporaries. I mean, you know, they used words like gross. I mean, when he when he talks about a woman's lips as being slippery blisses. I mean, you know, there's there's saliva there. There's a body fluid and they go sort of Ugh, yuck. Um, so we've got the medical background and um, which I think feeds into this um, that this sensory nature of his language, uh, and because it has given him this very intimate, intimate relationship with the human body. And then we've got his education slightly earlier on at school. As I said, he didn't go to a, a posh public school, but he did go to a very brilliant school where he probably got a better education um, at that stage, maybe even than Byron or Shelley. It was a former dissenting academy um, and um, he was much mocked by his critics later on for not having learned ancient Greek. But the reason why he hadn't learned ancient Greek was because the curriculum was so broad at this school that there wasn't really space for it because he was learning astronomy and French and history and all sorts of other things. And he was learning an awful lot of Latin. He did become a, a, a very accomplished Latin scholar. Um, I was talking a bit about the uh, critical attacks that he um, had to withstand um, during his career. Um, and a lot of them, particularly in Blackwood's magazine, Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine, in a review unsigned but written by J.G. Lockhart, um, it mocks Keats for being vulgar and undereducated and that he only knows Homer from Chapman. And that Chapman was a, um, um, a translation of Homer that in fact inspired um, the very, very first great poem that Keats wrote. It was certainly the first poem that got him noticed. It kick-started his career, his sort of breakthrough poem, as it were. And because it's so important, it was so important to me in my book, as it were, to put the poetry up front, because of course, you know, the poetry is why we're here at all. The poetry is really why we're interested in Keats at all. I thought I'd read a couple of poems tonight. And the first one I'm going to read is On First Looking Into Chapman's Homer. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft 
of one wide expanse had I been told, that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demean. Yet never did I breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken. Or like stout Cortes, when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific. And all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. Now that's one of Keats's most frequently anthologized poems. Um, I think it, it. I think it's one of the, the earliest of his to be anthologized. I think it's actually in the um, Paul Graves Golden Treasury, the first one, eighteen sixty-one. And I mentioned at the at the beginning um, something about how often when we we read poems in an anthology, they're sort of somehow sort of disembodied, decontextualized, deracinated. And you know, I mean, how many people who've read that poem? Um, know what Chapman's Homer was, who Chapman was. To some extent, it doesn't matter at all, because I think that's a poem about, um, you know, <clears throat> a creative response to reading. But on the other hand, it, it, it sort of makes our, our own response so much richer when we do know a bit about its context, and we do know a bit about Chapman. I am... Um, <clears throat> I said earlier that um, that Keats had had been to this really rather extraordinary school, Clark's Academy, in Enfield, and one of the things that he did there, he made very good friends with the headmaster's son. He was about eight years older than him, and with this chap, Charles Cowden Clark, Keats would study English poetry. He'd study it in great detail. He'd study, um, you know, all the different forms like the sonnet and the epic. He'd study the great poets, but not necessarily the poets of his own era or of the later 18th century. He'd study poets from an earlier era, from the Shakespearean era. So Spencer, Shakespeare, Milton, and indeed George Chapman, who was a contemporary of Shakespeare. I think with that poem, it's it's one it's one of these examples where we are so lucky, and I felt so lucky as a biographer that we can sometimes know the precise circumstances in which Keats wrote a poem, sort of, you know, when it was written, where it was written, why it was written, who its first reader was. There is actually a lovely bit in one of Keats's letters where he describes himself. Um, he, he's writing to his brother who's in America, and Keats gives us. A very, um, a very vivid account of, of Keats's own bodily position as he's, you know, I'm sitting here with my back to the to the fire, with one foot rather askew from the rug, and oh, he thinks, if only I could have known what position Shakespeare was sitting in when he wrote "To Be or Not to Be." Obviously, we can never know that about Shakespeare. There just isn't the biographical material. But what we are so lucky about with these great 19th century um, writers who write these voluminous letters is that we can often know precisely those things. And it does sometimes, sorry to go off on a bit of a tangent, but it worries me, the era of the email and the text, it worries me how future literary biographers are going to... Are, are, are going to, to deal with their you know, subjects writings. I mean, um, you know, to what extent will emails, you know, even survive? And they just don't have that sort of, you know, especially when you actually get to see a manuscript in real life and you'd really feel incredibly close to the person who wrote it. But sorry, I'm, I've gone off on a tangent. I want to come, bring us back to Chapman's Homer which was written um, in October 1816. Now Keats at this time, he's working all hours as a junior doctor. And what he and his friend Charles Cowden Clark want to do, what Keats wants to do on his evening off is to go round to his friend Charles's house and to read this, what by then was a, you know, a book that's like over a hundred years old, um, more than over a hundred years old. I mean, you know, um, you know, nearly 200 years old. Um, um, 
uh, and 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 you know so what are these two young men you know why you know they they have supper they have a drink and then they're reading this book why is it so exciting to them and I think they weren't dusty old academics. I think it's we've got to get us back, ourselves back into a mindset where there was something very radical at that stage about being interested in Chapman's translation of Homer in particular, and indeed of those writers of an earlier generation. Because at that time, the sort of gold standard in Homer translation was the one written by Alexander Pope, the great 18th century Augustan, which is all written in these very measured, polite, rational, um, poetic couplets. And it's not that Keats doesn't know anything about Homer because he has already read Pope's translation and the excitement he feels on reading Chapman is that he feels that there is something so alive in Chapman's language that Pope missed. And we're really lucky because Charles Cowden Clark, his friend, in fact, wrote a memoir in which he recalled that evening and he recalled very precisely the passage in Homer that they were reading and why it excited Keats so much. And this is a passage in the Odyssey where Odysseus is being, he sort of is washed up onto a beach, half drowned. And Pope describes this in these rather sort of prissy terms. He says, from mouth and nose, the briny torrents ran and lost in lassitude lay all the man. Now, Keats and Clark, they find this completely risible. And it is a little bit, I mean, you know, the way, I mean, you know, Pope was a most brilliant technician of the heroic couplet. And somehow they managed to have, 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 have hit on his, probably his two worst lines. Although I have to say, um, a friend of mine who's a professor of 18th century literature did actually recently tell me that Pope did not, in fact, write every single line of his best-selling Homer translation. Some of it was done by assistants and maybe this bit was. But anyway, so we get this very sort of prissily itemized nose and mouth and then that weird abstract circumlocution lost in lassitude lay all the man. Anyway, George Chapman renders that whole, the, all, the, all that in this one phrase, the sea had soaked his heart through. And you can see that how sort of brilliantly concise that is, how it yokes the physical and the emotional in one. Um, you know, you can just feel him simultaneously being soaked to the skin and touched to the heart. Um, and Keats and, and Clark, they love this. They think that the poetry of that earlier era of Shakespeare, of Milton, of Chapman, of Spencer, they think this is more authentic um, than, than Pope, for example. They think um, that and, it, and interestingly, their love of English poetry also has a political dimension, uh, a political dimension on sort of what we now call the left. They feel that there's a sense, in which, particularly with the Republic of Milton, that they're sort of going back to old English liberties. And in a sense, what they want to do is to free the English language from its chains. They want, and, and that's in a sense what I feel that Keats is doing when he's channeling this very sort of Shakespearean um, richness of, of, of metaphor and concrete imagery. Um, as I was saying earlier, um, Keats was on the receiving end of some really very, very negative vituperation. And this, I should be pointing out, was actually sort of really part of the culture wars uh, of the time. Um, and there was a lot of political motivation behind it because Keats's mentor, Lee Hunt, who was the editor of The Examiner, uh, which promoted Keats, where this poem, Chapman's Homer, was first showcased, um, had been, uh, you know, they were, I mean, Lee Hunt was a radical who'd been imprisoned for libeling, libeling the Prince Regent and the right wing Blackwoods magazine um, are absolutely sort of have the knives out for, for Lee Hunt and his so-called Cockney School of Poets, um, among whom um, Keats is um, a leading figure um, and the one who is who is most mocked. Um, you know, as I said, you know, comments like driveling idiocy. And it's not just that they also find his poetry, they find it smutty, they find it vulgar, um, and they fling all these insults at it. Now, they're totally wrong to think that Keats's poetry was bad. It isn't bad. It's, it's you know, 
as um, um, Campbell quoted that wonderful quote from the former American poet um, Laure laureate Robert Pinsky, um, which in fact, I think I was going to quote as well, um, that, you know, that for a certain lyrical essence of poetry written in English, Keats in his greatest poems surpasses every writer since Shakespeare. Um, on the other hand, I think we've got to we've got to listen to the early critics a tiny bit, um, just because I think that you know I think it's important to realise how unsettling Keats's poetry was that it sort of hits a nerve, um, and that you know as I said earlier we're so familiar with it. Um, I I I think that you know we. You know, it's good to make it strange again because Keats is, you know, Keats is very much associated with the idea of the beautiful. But I think that that can be, you know, it's not an easy idea of beautiful. There's a lot of sort of abrasion and conflict in in, in Keats's use of conflicting imagery. I, I, I and I and I, you know, I like to feel that Keats still can unsettle us. Um, you know, that you know, pleasure is always sort of. You know, cheek by jowl with with pain. There are, you know, even in Ode to Autumn, there are wailing gnats. There are flies in Ode to a Nightingale, um, and I, you know, I, I think that I don't know how much longer have I got. About ten, fifteen minutes. Um, ten, ten, fantastic. Um, um, one of the. Um, the most famous concepts that Keats came up with in his letters, which I'm sure you'll all have heard of, negative capability, uh, which he described as being the the ability to be in a state of uh, 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 of doubt or mystery without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Um, for me, one of the one of the great things that Keats teaches us, and one of the great things he does in his poetry, is that he really makes the most of what a literary text can do what literary creativity can do that say a, a non-fiction um text can't do that a work of philosophy or or something can't do in a literary text two things can simultaneously as it were be true at the same time they can be sort of held in suspension at the same time and i think that that's i think keats does that that brilliantly now, Shelley's Adonais that I, I, I talked about earlier, that too is an intervention in these culture wars. Because of Keats, of course, Keats, sorry, Shelley too um, is, uh, it, well, I mean, Keats is, Keats is definitely a liberal. He's on, you know, he's on the radical, he's on, he's on as I said, what we call the left. He's not quite as way out as, as Shelley, who's this sort of, well, but, but Shelley has this incredible sense of entitlement. He's this sort of upper class anarchist who feels that he can be as radical as he likes partly because you know he's you know he's 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 living off his future inheritance and and he's got this internal sense of unshakable um self-confidence um but yeah so that so the the this political culture war that Keats gets bound up in by the time he dies Shelley has every sort of um reason to want to turn Keats into this sort of spiritualized martyr he wants a romantic martyr um a, a liberal romantic martyr and one of the reasons I think why he as I said sort of I use that use I'm repeating myself but I use that word spiritualized turns him into this sort of abstract essence is that one of the things about Keats that really sort of disturbed people at the time um worried them was the incredibly sort of physical and sensual way in which he talks um not just about the human body but about physical desire um you know that is why you know a lot of his um his, his critics thought he was smutty um and of course keats does not talk doesn't write about sex in a sort of anatomically crude way i mean it's all done um with through metaphor but there's i have absolutely no doubt in my mind that his contemporaries um sort of saw under that under the metaphor and uh, and knew and, and knew what he was writing about i mean you know they say things like rather puritanical critic says 
We will assure him, however, that not all the flimsy veil of words in which he would involve immoral images can atone for their impurity. Now, I found it quite interesting since, I, since publishing this book that I found myself almost caught in, as, as it were, some more culture wars in our, in our own era. Um, and that when I've discussed, for example, Keats's poem, The Eve of St. Agnes, um, I'm sure a lot of you know it. It's one of his, one of his most brilliant, um, um, lovely, um, sensual narrative poem set in the Middle Ages based on the legend that on St. Agnes' Eve, if a virgin sort of performs the right rituals and goes to bed when she's asleep, she'll dream of her future lover or, or husband. And so in the poem, Madeline does all this um, and she goes to sleep, goes to bed, goes to sleep. But what she doesn't know is that a real flesh and blood would-be lover has crept into the castle, crept into her bedroom, watched her undress, um, um, and then um, as she's still asleep, creeps into bed with her. And basically in very sort of lushly metaphorical language uh, but there is a sort of there is a you know a passionate consummation of the love of, of, of his love for her it's a little bit worrying in our days of me too that she's still asleep at the time and she hasn't really been able to to to, to give her consent but the very fact that um that i sort of pointed this out and it's not it's not, it's not a particularly original reading that there are elements in the poem that do portray porphyro um the lover sorry i called him lorenzo before that's in another poem porphyro um um uh, uh, you know i mean you know he's yeah, this um you know uh, you know, she, he's sort of described almost as being a bit like a hunter. She's like a like like a a a, a bird, and she's like a she's um uh, she's described as being like the tongueless nightingale, which is an allusion to that same myth of Philomel, who of course is raped. Um, now, when I suggested that that you know there was some act of sexual consummation happening in this poem whose heroine by the way she goes to bed a virgin but her name is madeline which is like mary magdalene and a magdalene was another word for a fallen woman and indeed keats um at guy's hospital it was next door to the magdalene hospital which was a, a rescue home for for fallen women and um and prostitutes um, so, you know, when I suggested that maybe there was some sex going on in this poem, I was I was attacked as somebody actually called me a disgustingly paranoid breed of femocrit. No. Um, and this really, it really showed me how this has, had really struck a nerve, even today. And another critic um, suggested, well, you know, was very, very complimentary about my book. Um, but on the other hand, said, oh, but she gets it wrong. They certainly don't have sex in The Eve of St. Agnes. Now, it wasn't me who said that they had sex. It was actually Keats's own publisher who, um, in um, you know, he, he, he gets the draft of the poem. He says, come on, Keats, we can't publish this. It's, it, it, it's, far, too, it's, it, it's far too explicit. It's far too, um, you know, it'll completely alienate women readers. And the publisher himself was quite clear what was going on. He says, Porphyro, um, um, Presses breast upon breast and acts all the acts of a bona fide husband, while she um, merely thinks she's playing the part of a wife in a dream. So clearly, this issue of, um, you know, clearly he thinks that, you know, he's performing all the acts of a bona fide husband. And there's a slightly worrying thing going on about the fact that she thinks it's only happening in a dream. I mean, clearly, it's not just a sort of modern Me Too anxiety. Keats's publisher even ha had a bit of that, too. And Keats's response is quite interesting. It's quite, it's, it's quite, it's quite funny in a way. I mean, he, he gets really up in arms and he puts on this sort of macho posture and says, ah, oh, you know, only a eunuch would have left a maid a maid in such a situation. Now, I 
don't read this as being Keats himself being a sexual predator. Far from it. This to me is an index of his of his insecurity. And in fact, the 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 theme for this poem was suggested um, by a woman. We all know about Fanny Braun, and I'm not going to have time really to talk much about his relationship with her. But before um, he 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 fell in love with Fanny Braun, he had a, a, another relationship with a rather mysterious woman called Mrs. Isabella Jones, um, and who's a very sort of sophisticated and flirtatious woman and it was she who suggested rather you know as a almost I, I think probably slightly almost with a slight sense of satire that he should he should take on this this subject of of, of the Eves and Agnes and the thing the irony is that when Keats has an encounter with Mrs Jones he's previously on a previous occasion as he tells us warmed with her and kissed her um, on this occasion, she sort of does that. And he's actually feeling very, very insecure. So I was, I, I, I'm afraid I have rabbited on rather a lot. I, uh, I want to wind up by saying that um, I was, in fact, I was going to, well, shall I just read you another poem? Have we got time for another poem? I'm going to read you one more poem. Um, just quickly, Keats' complicated attitude to women, and maybe we'll have some questions about it afterwards. Go back to his mother, who abandoned him um, when he was little. Um, and I think Keats's complicated attitude towards women comes out in what I think is possibly my favourite poem by Keats. It's a very well-known one, and it's a short one. Um, La Belle Dame Sans Merci. Sorry, I'm definitely going to need my glasses for this one. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms? Alone and palely loitering. The sedge is wither from the lake and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, so haggard? And so woe begone. The squirrel's granary is full and the harvest is done. I see a lily on thy brow with anguish moist, and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child, her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head and bracelets too, and fragrant zone. She looked at me as she did love, and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long. Beside long she would bend and sing a fairy's song. She found me roots of reddish sweet, and honey wilds, and manna dew, and, and sure, in language strange, she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept, and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses full. And there she lulled me to sleep, and there I dreamed. Oh, woe betide. The latest dream I ever dreamt on the cold hill side. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, La belle dame saw merci thee hath in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam, with horrid warning gaped wide. And I awoke and found me here on the cold hill's side. And this is why I sojourn here alone and palely loitering. Though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. Thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Lacasta. We're just going to take a break for just a few minutes and then we'll probably get set up for the Q&A. Um, just before I hit the gavel, Lacasta had told me of a curious little coincidence this evening. Her husband, who is the superb and noted tenor, Ian Bostrich, was just about to take the stage in London at the same moment she was about to speak here. So um, it's not often that happens. So a few minutes break and uh, Q&A. Okay. Okay, could we, uh, could we start to in invite some questions, please? Right away. <laughs> the lady in the blue here. Thank you very much for the, the talk, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I've always wondered whether Kate's had issues with alcohol and drug misuse. I mean, he liked his claret, but if oh. you think of the line of emptied some dull opiate yes, drain that yes, leafy yes. ones had sunk, you think, oh, yeah, he seems well, to know about that. And if so, bearing do you think it might have on his imagery and poetry? That's a very interesting question. Um, I mean, he certainly, I think he worries that he, at times, that he is drinking too much. At one point, he... Um, um, he says, oh, I'm, I, I'm never have more than three glasses at a time now. Um, 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 uh, um, and, it, and his mother was, in fact, an alcoholic. She was uh, addicted to brandy. Um, uh, I mean, the rather tragic story of his mother was that, um, that, uh, that um, after his father is killed in an accident, she runs off with another man. Keats and his siblings never live with her again. They go to their grandparents. Um, then her relationship with the other man breaks up. Then she's living in sin with yet another man. And by the time she crawls back to her own mother's, she's um, addicted to brandy and also dying of TB. So, um, um, yes, in terms of the opiates, I mean, you know, some people have said, you know, was he actually, you know, taking laudanum as he was writing Ode to a Nightingale? I find it, I, I think that's unlikely. Um, I mean, you know, I think you you would need a level of, um, you know, intense concentration. But then again, I mean, it's he does write that poem uh, with astonishing quickness and facility. And, you know, it has occurred to me, I mean, you know, the, the sort of parallel with the sort of jazz improvisers who, you know, many of them very famously took a lot of heroin. And, you know, that, that, that sort of sense of, um, you know, your sort of, not being impeded by too much conscious thought, allowing it to just come out. And, you know, I mean, the manuscript of Ode to a Nightingale, which is quite clearly the first draft that's in the Fitzwilliam Museum because he does a false start on one side. I mean, he's clearly written it in one, one fell swoop. But whether or not he needed any chemical enhancement, I don't know. I mean, um, um, but I think he was possibly, I think, I think he was possibly worried about, I think, I think these physical appetites were things that he, he sounds very exuberant about at times. I also think they're things that cause him, cause him anxiety, um, as with, with, with physical passion and his feelings about women. Thank you. Graham, be, behind you there, another question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for an enjoyable short talk. I always had great problems at school with interpretation, but I'm thinking perhaps I never understood English. However, my question is, uh, in your lecture, I felt you've spent an awful lot of the time talking about the attitude of others towards Keats and his work rather than Keats's view of his life and his work. Am I correct, or do we, as a biographer of someone who's been dead for two hundred years, is it difficult to know what he was thinking when he wrote? Well, it's interesting you said. I hadn't really sort of, I hadn't really thought that that was particularly what I was what I was doing. Um, not quite sure what to say to that. Um, no, I mean, I you know, all I can say is read my book because it will tell you what um, it will tell you what Keats was doing and what Keats was thinking. But I think it's because I started off by talking about the way that um, about the sort of, in a sense, the myth of Keats um, and 
that was the, uh, uh, you know, but I'm just awfully sorry, I can't give you a better answer, except please read my book. Hi there, thanks for a uh, fascinating talk. Do you see the, the influence of Keats in any modern day poets? If so, who are they? And if not, why not? In any modern day poets? You're, you're asking me some very, very difficult questions tonight. <laughs> do, do, do you? Do you? Wait, I, I, I see, because I'd like to know. I, I, I see that there's a certain rebelliousness. You, you pointed out, I didn't know much about Keats when I came here tonight. But when you talked about... You, see, you don't know that much about contemporary poetry, but maybe we ought to get together well, and you can... Yeah, if you you like can enlighten me. Um, I, I was interested in the, 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 the mixing of the bodily with the emotion and the intellectual, and I see some poets tearing things down, but I, I wondered if you saw his influence in helping do that. Sorry? If, in, that. in helping helping people break up the subject matter and bolt it together in a different way and analyze things differently. I was, I'm thinking of maybe poets like Kate Tempest or Holly McNish. Well, as I said, I'm really, you know, contemporary poetry just on sadly, and I, you know, feel really ashamed isn't my thing and I you know I'm really good well I will definitely read Kate Tempest now uh, thank you very much for the lecture I just wanted to ask you perhaps to speculate a little bit because our our view of Keats is very much tied up with the tragedy of his early death so what do you think would have happened to him if he had lived longer? And, and which, in which direction would his poetry have gone? That's an absolutely wonderful and fascinating question. Um, would he have carried on writing poetry at all? A lot of his co contemporaries, um, you, um, you know, people that we haven't really heard of anymore, like Barry Cornwall. There are a lot of these um, young men who are writing poetry during this romantic moment where poetry is the thing to do, who then stop and go off and become solicitors or sort of accountants. And it's perfectly possible that Keats might have gone back to medicine. I mean, I only say, I don't, I mean, I say that partly because I'm very aware of what happened to the literary marketplace um, in the years after Keats died, that, the, that the, the, the market for poetry became incredibly commercialized. I really don't think that Keats could have um, made, I mean, especially had he lived, had he married Fanny Braun and had a family, he would not have been able to make a living from his pen um, in a way that would have, satisfied his own sort of poetic needs. Um, the, my previous book to this one was um, a book about a poet called Letitia Landon, who was the one of the biggest um, English poets of this sort of period between the Romantics and the Victorians, between, you know, the death of Byron in 1824, rise of Dickens, sort of end of the 1830s. Um, and hers is a tragic story of a sort of, you know, talent really sort of corrupted by um, the demands of, of, of the marketplace. Um, poetry was not really in a very good place in the 1820s and 1830s. There is, though, the possibility that, Kate, that Keats could have um, turned to a different sort of writer. He would have, I mean, he would have written amazingly for the stage, I think. I mean, he did, um, he did write an unperformed tragedy, which isn't particularly good but but you know um or you know perhaps he could even have written novels um but I don't feel that he would have felt comfortable as a hack having to make his living by his pen and had he married Fanny Braun and had a family he would have had to have made his living and yeah I mean I don't know interesting though uh, I was asking you about Byron and Scott both being able to sell more books in an afternoon than Keats and Shelley in their entire lives. And my question is, how did Keats become popular? 
Yeah, well, it happened during the course of the 19th century, um, and particularly after Richard Monckton Mills publishes his Life and Letters in 1848. Um, and so by the mid 19th century, um, Keats is really being um, talked about in, in very, very complimentary terms, but it does take a few decades for him to become well, as, as I said, you, you find him in Paul Gray's anthology in 1861. So you can see that by that stage, he's well known enough and appreciated enough. Um, but yes, it but but you know the, the history of his reputation, even in the course of the 19th century, has its own ups and downs. I mean, when he um, when his letters to Fanny Brawn are finally published, the Victorians all you know all think it's terrible. They 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 they. they, they they think he's a sort of, um, you know, emotionally incontinent, sort of whinging. They, 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 you know, the things Swinburne says about him are absolutely awful. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it goes up and down. But certainly by the end of the 19th century, Keats is enshrined almost as he is now as being one of the, the great lyric poets in the English language. Was he buried in Westminster Abbey at the time? Sorry? Was he buried in Poets' Corner at the time? Keats. Yeah. He's buried in Rome. He's buried in Rome where he died um, with this gravestone that does not even have his name on it. It All it has is, uh, um, well, well, the inscription on it was put there by his friends. Um, and it has Keats's own epitaph, here lies one whose name was written water, but um, but but the 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 full epitaph um is about how you know basically accusing his critics of having handed him to death. So presumably he's got a plaque in Poets Corner. I don't know. I don't know. He's got a he's got but his house is a museum in in in, in London, which I really highly recommend anybody to visit. And um Question way at the, the back there, Adrian. Thank you, and thank you for a wonderful lecture. It seems there's a, a sort of body sensuality in Shakespeare and Johnson, mm. but Keats seems to be making a deliberate attempt to sort of cut through the buttoned upness, if you like, that came after. So he's, in a way, a sort of reactionary by going back in time. Is that fair? So I didn't catch the last bit of. So it seems he's not really being a he's being a reactionary by going back to a kind of body or past. And in fact, I think Shakespeare's reputation suffered a little bit in the 17th century. It's seen as a bit too racy. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't quite. I still didn't quite. Can you speak more slowly, please? I'm sorry. It's... Um, I just uh, were, were you were you saying that um, that that uh, that Keats is not being revolutionary because he's going back in time to the work? Yeah, there seems to be this kind of, sort of yes. body sensuality. It was yes, you know, yes, just a, that, an older thing. Yes, but what the point I was trying to make was that for people at the time, for Keats and Lee Hunt and Charles Cadden Clark and people like that, they didn't think of it as backward looking. They thought of it as forward looking. Um, for example, you know, even politically, looking back to Milton the Republican, um, they 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 think of it. It's it's absolutely cutting edge, even though it's stuff that's written a long time ago. Thank you. Okay. I, I don't know if I. Need, I've got a question myself. Of course. A task that relates to to Burns, who we were hearing about two weeks ago, and the fact that. Um, Keats made his, his his walking trip and he turned sharp left at Gretna Green and went across to Dumfries and the purpose being to pay homage really um, to, to Burns at his grave but he'd been preceded a number of years before by Coleridge, the Wordsworths doing exactly the same not on foot but on a pony and trap mm -hmm. and they also kind of hero worship. Burns to an extent mm. uh, in a literary fashion, but also possibly Burns, the embodiment of ability, talent, genius, nothing to do with privilege, mm. Uh, mm. privilege education, yeah. and the rest of something maybe we haven't totally learned today in this country. But um, could you explain a little bit more about the Burns and the Romantic poets, why they felt so strongly about him? <laughs> 
Gosh, um, again, I'm not a Burns scholar, so it's not, it's not, uh, I mean, you should have asked your lecturer last week. Um, I think that's, I, I, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's a, I think that's a very good point about the, um, that, that sense of, of democracy of talent. But actually, Keats has a, Keats has quite a complicated view of Burns. He, he, you know, he goes into the cottage and he goes, oh, misery, and he talks about Burns and he says, oh, my God, this man was a genius, but he he talked with bitches and he drank with blackguards. And he, you know, so he's not, you know, he does not have an idealised view of, Keat, of, of Burns at all. Um, and in a sense that, you know, that, you know, I don't think he has an idealised view of himself either. Um, and I think that I think yes, I think he was very fascinated by the idea of this genius pouring out from somebody. And I don't know enough about the real Burns to know how much Ke what Keats was imbibing was to some extent a myth of Burns. Um, but that he he saw Burns as somebody who yeah who had a who had a, a miserable and in some ways quite sordid life. Thanks, Professor. Any other questions for it? Or this. Is this working? Yeah. Um, I was going to say that we studied as St. Agnes at school, mm -hmm. and I had a question about that. But yes. um, you you just said in answer to the previous question, you said that the 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 writing on Keats's grave suggests that he he was hounded to death mm. by his critics. Um, that seems a terrible thing. Was that was that what Keith, Keats himself felt? Because earlier you implied it that was he was really shady. quite robust it's, about. Well, his... that's a very very interesting question. Just literally in the immediate aftermath of Keats having this, this horrific attack on him in Blackwood's magazine is the moment where he actually says to his brother, well, I believe I'll be among the English poets after my death. So in the moment, I don't I think he's actually quite strong. I don't think he's I don't think it's it under and he goes and that's even before he's written his great masterpieces. He then goes on to write to have this wonderful flowering in the year 1819. Um, it was really Shelley who, in his in the preface to his elegy Adonais, um, attacks these, particularly these right wing magazines, who have been so horrible about Keats. Um, and it's as I said, it's and it's it's it, it, you know, we're really talking politics here. I mean, Shelley wants a reason to attack these right-wing magazines because Shelley's a radical and Shelley, I mean, uh, um, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that myth really sort of begins with Shelley and then Keats' own friends sort of pick it up and, um, and add it onto the gravestone. I mean, the actual words are... Um, yeah, um, this grave contains... Um, all that was mortal of a young English poet who on his deathbed, in the bitterness of his heart at the malicious power of his enemies, desired that these words be engraved on his tombstone. Now, if you actually look at the, the letter written at the time when Keats comes up with that um, epitaph for himself, um, that he dictates to his friend Joseph Seffen, who's there with him in... Um, in Rome nursing him. There's, in fact, Seven says actually he, he went to sleep more peacefully that night. Um, you know, there's, there's it, it is not connected in any way, Keats is not connecting this epitaph in any way with um, attacks on him by his enemies. And I think, you know, Shelley portrays him as this very sort of frail and fragile creature. Um, and of course, you know, by the time he's dying, um, he's he is incredibly, frail and fragile, but it wasn't the assaults of, of the critics, it was tuberculosis that did it to him. <laughs> but the examples you read are truly horrifically vicious. Tro no, I, mean, I think trolling. what he found, but, and it was, the, it was the sort of the sno social snobbery as well, because he's quite sort of, um, quite, he's quite sensitive about that. Um, and the way that Lockhart attacks him by saying, oh, Lockhart has actually found out the secret that Keats is a former apothecary's um, apprentice. Um, because in, uh, um, 
in fact, because he's met a mutual friend of theirs at a dinner party. But Lockhart, you know, portrays it, speaks as if from this position of sort of aristocratic auteur, complaining that too many people are writing poems these days, even our footmen compose tragedies. Now, these this in this culture war, this is this is all a bit of posturing. I mean, Lockhart, no way could Lockhart's Lockhart afford a footman, you know, I mean, he's a very highly educated young man. He's been to several universities and Keats hasn't been to any. Um, but Keats finds this, um, uh, you know, he finds this not just patronizing, he finds it really, really humiliating. He's very sort of touchy about his social status. And he's really, you know, he's sort of a spite, what he wants, he wants to be the Shelley or the Byron. But he hasn't got the social standing or really even the money to to, to be that. Well, I think it's terrible. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Well, I see what I detect to be a few thirsty faces um, around the audience. I think it's it, it's time now to to um, thank Lucasta very much on behalf of the society for following in the footsteps eventually of John Keats and making a visit to Glasgow. I, I don't think we've startled you in quite the way that uh, the previous inhabitant did to Keats, but uh, we hope not anyway. <laughs> well, I should have said, you know, at no point have I, um, have I, have I felt tempted to call the police. And also, I really have had the most unbelievably, wonderfully warm welcome. So we now have a much clearer idea of Keats's body and soul, and that can be supplemented by a close reading of Lacaster's book, which may have been mentioned before. It only falls so thank you so much. Um, and that's worth a round of applause, I think, Lucas.